So the subject today, chaos, is probably the most important idea of the first part of this quarter. Um, the kind of main phenomenon we're going to look at, right? So, so the, the, the theme here first was, oh, we get to stick our head inside the gray box and see what can go on, how behaviors can change as a function of parameters and so on. Um, now I just want to focus in on this complicated so-called chaotic behavior and give a definition of it so we can be a little more precise and start thinking about how to be quantitative about how unpredictable or complicated these solution sets are. So today we can start moving in that direction and give a, no longer a, we're no longer using the word chaos in this qualitative sense. We'll give a nice quantitative definition. One of the benefits is we're actually going to be able to look into higher dimensions and kind of imagine all the different kinds of attractors that can happen in arbitrary dimension as we become more quantitative about this. So we'll end on a classification scheme. <clears throat> okay, so what is this? I mean, so far we've been talking about these nonlinear systems in terms of, and we've been looking at very uh, complicated trajectories or orbits, very difficult to follow. If you even think back to the physical devil with a pendulum, right? Extreme behaviors right around the magnet or at large energy, quite predictable, almost periodic. And then there's this intermediate range where it's quite, the orbits are quite complicated. Um, also, there's this notion of recurrence, where you constantly come back to the same part of the state space, never exactly repeating, because then that would be a periodic orbit, since the equations themselves are deterministic means you're in one state, the next state is completely different. So these the close pass, but also sort of built in this local divergence. Nearby trajectories are moving apart from each other. And that's going to be a key thing we're going to try to quantify. And the other way where we're talking about it, again, it's very uh, qualitatively, was that if we didn't have exact control over the initial condition, think of the pendulum again, downstream the eventual behavior, which magnet the pendulum bob was attracted to was hard to forecast or predict. In some sense, all you can do there is give a probabilistic description of which of the four magnets the system was going to go up with. Even though, you know, instant by instant, it's a completely deterministic system. So we need to understand how a system makes these complicated behaviors, complicated trajectories. So, so I'll use the word geometry here. What kind of geometry in the state space produces this? So that's the, the theme today, is to look at what I'm going to call stretching and folding. There's a very uh, prosaic description of what's going on. These nonlinear differential equations are nonlinear discrete time maps. What they're doing is they're taking state space as if it was a piece of dough and stretching it out and folding it over. So that's what I mean. And I'm going to give a series of examples where we start with sort of the, sim the simplest stretch and fold mechanism and then increase the complexity, complicatedness of the model so that we can move towards more realistic systems like the pendulum, the Lorenz and Whistler. But the first models will distill the essential aspect of the stretch and fold mechanism and will let us lead us to a way of thinking quantitatively about how unpredictable a system is. So, so this is like the current instability. So things are stretching out Neighboring trajectories are stretching out, but for this to be an attractor, the set solution set to be an attractor, somehow this has to fold back on itself to be a compact object. The attractor. So that's what we need to understand. So the first model, and this really is the zeroth level canonical model of a chaotic system, is called, well, no surprise, the Baker's transformation. So we really should be thinking about state space, dough. So what I'm going to show you here is a two-dimensional state space. So this is a map of the plane to itself. It takes a point to another plane. But let me just introduce it first in terms of how it operates on a whole state space. So, and I'm coloring things here just to guide the eye. So I'm going to take this unit square and this Baker's map. The first thing it's going to do is stretch it horizontally along the x-axis by a factor of 2. And it's going to shrink vertically by a factor of 2. So half the height, twice the width. The amount of doughs conserved here, there is the same. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut, and here's why I'm using the, the green and yellow 
colors to guide the eye. I cut right at the halfway point on this wide strip. Then I stacked the green half to right half above the, uh, the yellow part. So, that, so this is one step. This is what this map is going to do, and then I just do it again. So when I do it again, I start with this cut and stacked piece here, and I do it again. So now I'm going to stretch it by a factor of two horizontally, shrink it by a factor of two vertically, and then I cut and stack. So again, we're not leaving any dough on the cooking board here. All the area is conserved. But now you sort of notice one thing, I'm starting to get these sprites. So initially, we had two stripes. I did it the second time, I had four stripes. And if I did it a third time, I'd have eight stripes. If I did it 10 times, I'd have 1,024 stripes. So just doing this operation 10 times produces a very, uh, it's like phyllo dough, right, or making plus off or something. Layers and layers and layers. Not only that, in the horizontal direction, if I had two initial states, because in each full iteration of this map, if I had them separated by a little delta, that's going to grow. That will double each time. So even if I start arbitrarily far apart, some little delta difference, after I've done this 10 times, not only do I have 1,024, 210 layers, this initially close pair of points will be a factor of 1,024 further apart after just 10 operations. So that's the main idea. Now, it's idealized, and we'll see how it's idealized when I make these maps a little more realistic. So you can ask, you know, is there some prototype system I can do? Yeah? So if you have two points that are vertically aligned but are very close, are they going to remain close? Uh, until you hit a certain number of iterations? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Right. So it's almost the um, complementary argument to what I said about two nearby horizontal points that, that just differed horizontally by some epsilon. That's going to double each time. Two times larger, four times larger. Ver if they're exactly vertically separated, because I'm squishing by a factor of two, any little delta is going to go down by a factor of two, a factor of a quarter, a factor of eight, exponentially fast. So we'll come back to that. Yeah. Um. So if you have the two points and they're getting farther and farther apart horizontally, yeah. wouldn't there reach a point where when you cut down the center and stack it, right. then they would get stacked, so they wouldn't necessarily be 10 to the 24 points farther away? Right. Well, if they were 10 to the minus 26 together, then they would still be right, right. in the same horizontal line. But you're absolutely right. This, this That unit square has a size. So as soon as that separation gets on the order of one, those two points will now fall into two different pieces that are getting stacked, and so the notion of difference, at least the simple argument I make, falls apart. Yeah. Right. Okay, so we'd like to study some equations, some dynamical system, explicit equations to study. So I claim that this pair of equations implements this Baker's map. So in the x direction, I just multiply the x state, the, the x horizontal component of the two-dimensional state I2. Um, I do this mod one, is I want everything to map back into the unit circle. And then the horizontal direction, I multiply the vertical coordinates by half. That's going to give me the shrinking by a factor of two. And then the cutting is done partly with this mod one up here. And then also by adding this offset. So, for, so when, when the x coordinate is greater than a half, it's going to take all of that part, which is now, if you think about it, the graphical picture, the, the, the right hand side of the, the stretched horizontal slab. Offset it by half, that's essentially stacking it on top. So you should probably step through that argument to convince yourself that the, the graphics I just did are implemented this way. Okay, well, now we have some equations. We can do a little bit of analysis, despite all my sort of saying, oh, these things are unsolvable. We could ask, for example, what's the Jacobian? Okay, so I can form this matrix of partial derivatives. If I call the you know, x of n plus 1 equation the right hand side f for the y right hand side g, this would be partial f, partial x, partial f, partial y, and so on. And it's, it's simple. You can just read this off. There's only the x term in the equations. 
take the partial derivative of this with respect to x, I just get the two out, and with respect to y, there's nothing. Okay. So I end up with this diagonal matrix. So this upper number here is partial f, partial x, that's two, and then partial g, partial y is a half, and then this zero. Okay, we have a matrix. Uh, we can do a little linear algebra analysis. Um, the first thing to notice is that this matrix doesn't have any dependence on the current state, x, y. It's constant. Wherever I am in the square, I get this is the matrix. So that means locally, whatever the stability, it will be independent of where I am. It's uniformly the same stability question. So I just calculate out the eigenvalues. Well, okay, if you just do this by observation, we have a diagonal matrix. We know what the eigenvalues are. They're just on the diagonal. And so we have our largest eigenvalue is 2, and the next one is a half. Lambda 1 here, it corresponds to stretching horizontally and shrinking. And you can verify the directionality by looking at the associated eigenvector. So the eigenvector associated to eigenvalue 2 is just 1, 0. It's just pointing along the x-axis. And that, for the uh, lambda 2, second eigenvector being a half, that's purely vertical. So the two eigenvectors are perpendicular. Um, we can look at the determinant. So, so the determinant is telling us locally how much area is expanding, contracting. And we know that the determinant of a matrix is just the product of the eigenvalues. And we see 2 times a half is 1. So that tells us that this is area preserving, or that I'm not leaving any dough behind on the cooking board as I'm, nothing's dissipated in this more physical uh, language compendium. Okay. And then again, this analysis all independent of where you are. So every point in the state space has this horizontal stretching by a factor of two and vertical shrinking everywhere, uniform. And that's exactly where it's sort of a little too idealized. But okay. Um, also, because it's area preserving, we don't really have an attractor in the sense of where the Whistler and Lorenz, the flow is coming down to a rounded origin and staying in those sets. Uh, there's no shrinking here, so we can modify. And so this is the next step to make this Baker's map model more realistic. We can add a little area loss or a state space dissipation by adding a parameter. And what I mean graphically is very easy to say. We're going to start with the same unit square, and then what I'm going to do is I'll stretch it out, cut it in half, and then stack. But when I'm shrinking, I'm going to shrink it more than a factor of two. So a factor of three, a factor of four. So when I put the dough back in, there will be space. And the same thing happens again here. If I apply this again, so now I've done this once in the state space, I'll do it again. Right in here, I apply the stretch, cut, and stack. Now I have, now the layers are maybe a little more apparent. But now the set of states that you can visit, it's actually shrinking in the vertical direction. Say by a factor of three, it doesn't exactly map out there. So it's down by a factor of three. 9, 27, and so on, it's actually going to shrink in the vertical direction down to nothing. Okay. We'll come back to that. Well, how do I modify the previous uh, Baker's map equations to take this into account? I'm just going to add, as you probably guessed, just a coefficient in front of the y ends here. So before we had a is equal to a half, and that made it area preserving. Uh, but otherwise, the equations are the same. We still have a stacking here, x less than a half, x greater than a half, the two different treatments of the vertical coordinate, still offsetting by a half. But now I'm controlling how much shrinking I'm getting so that it is a subset at the next time step. Okay, so let's think of this as a control parameter that ranges from zero. Right? If a was zero, this would just go to a single line at the half. And then we'd have this just stretching horizontally. So that would be just a one dimensional object. Or when it's a half, that's the previous example where it fills out the full square. So A varying between those two is giving us this kind of phyllo dough structure. Same stability analysis here, except instead of a half on the diagonal, we now have A. So the calculations are straightforward again. The maximum eigenvalue is still 2, that's stretching in the horizontal direction, but now the shrinking is rate is A. You get yourself of that. That is the eigenvalue of the diagonal there. And then we, but we still have the same eigenvectors, horizontal and vertical, sort of stretching and shrinking. 
But now we can calculate the determinant of the Jacobian. Again, to calculate this area of preservation, or in this case, shrinking, it now depends on A. And so we say that areas are shrinking when A is a half. So, so if A was a half, then this would be one, and we preserve areas. When it's less than a half, then this is going to be shrinking every step by some factor. So if it was a to the third, then we'd have only two thirds of the unit area the first time, four ninths and so on. So now we can have attractors. We actually have a set that is invariant. It's curious, but it's an infinite time it's set, like invariant. And then it's being, wherever you start in the square, it's coming down to the set. So let me show you a simulation of this for A equal uh, 0 0.3. Okay. So again, we have these gaps here now. And if you squint your eye, you see there are two bands. Well, clean off your glasses a little bit, then you see one, two, three, four bands. Look a little more closely. Well, there are eight bands. Even more closely, there are 16 bands, and so on. Right, so now these bands are laying out what we call a fractal or self-similar structure. Right. One way to think about what that, uh, that uh, means is, again, if I squint my eyes, I see two bands. But if I zoom in, I can see two bands. If I zoom in here, I see two bands. As you zoom in, you keep seeing the same structure. So that's this notion of self-similarity. The set, these big, big sort of asymptotic invariant set, the set of points that you get attracted to, has a self-similar character. So if I magnify them up, I see the same thing again. I magnify it and all the way down. So this is a little bit strange. Um, it's a set of points that fills out lines horizontally, so it's at least one dimensional. But in the vertical direction, areas, you know, these lengths are shrinking exponentially fast, so it goes to a zero dimensional thing. But it's just not a single line. So what is it? So it brings up this question of how we can start to describe these complicated invariant sets. So virtually all of these chaotic attractors have this sort of helo dough self-similar structure. For those that have a very large contraction rate, we may not see it. And that's the case with the Rissler and the Lorenz. And we can think of them as sheets. OK, and we could do the uh, stability analysis. Again, this is just to emphasize. That's probably it stopped. That, that's fine. It, it's independent. Um, okay, so so again, how do we do stability? We look at some point in the plane here, and we just vary. Say epsilon in the horizontal direction, down in the vertical direction. We just plug that into equations and look at how the the, the output state x1, y1 changes as a function of that. And you can see again, it's, it's basically just writing out explicitly like that Jacobian analysis, where you see that in the changes in the horizontal direction. Are a function of epsilon, and they grow as a factor of two, and then the, the difference between the, uh, uh, the vertical direction is just a times that delta separation vertically. So if you did this repeatedly, separations in the horizontal direction go exponentially with the number of iterations of the function of epsilon. So that initial small separation horizontally grows, and then vertically it shrinks with a. One. OK, so we have this kind of strange set. It has structure to it, but it's somewhere between a one-dimensional line. And it's certainly not two-dimensional, because in the vertical direction, the uh, lines are shrinking to zero length. So how are we going to think about this? So this brings in the idea of the dimension of a set. So what I want to do to motivate the definition is have us think about sets whose dimension we all can agree on. So here, what we're going to do is look at this yellow square. And the yellow points are the set we're interested in. And that is two-dimensional. Okay. Now, the idea of dimension is what we're going to do is look at that set with a, think of it like a microscope where we have some resolution epsilon that we can zoom in on the set. And in each stage, we're going to look at how many 
at a given resolution, how many boxes, coarse grain boxes, contain pieces of the set? So in this first case, it's just to verify our intuitions about what two dimension is. So here, if I have this unit square and my measuring instrument, coarse grains with epsilon equal a half, I have four boxes. If I double the resolution or decrease epsilon by a factor of two, I now have four cells in each direction, and therefore 16 in the whole square. And do it again, the epsilon is one eighth, I have eight cells on each side, and therefore 64 in the whole square. So the number of squares is increasing as I zoom in. So if we ask, okay, how many cells do I have as a function of epsilon, you can, uh, and I'm thinking, you know, easy change in epsilon if I have to a quarter, so it fits in the unit square nicely. You can argue that the number of filled cells as a function of the resolution epsilon goes as epsilon to the minus two. And that exponent here is going to be our dimension. Right, if, for example, I had started out with the yellow set being a one-dimensional line. If I went from a half, I'd have two cells. Epsilon is a quarter, I have four cells. Epsilon eight, I have eight cells. The number of cells would grow linearly with the number of steps, or it would be this n of the epsilon function would be e to the minus one. You can also kind of imagine now if it were a cube and you did the same varying resolution counting experiment, then this would be minus three. Okay, so this number up here is our candidate for what a dimension is. Now a classic move, and this is a very common thing to do in dynamical systems, is there's some intuitive definition of what we mean by dimension. And what I do is actually kind of invert that. I'm interested in plugging in a set and doing this box counting at different epsilons. So what I'm gonna do is turn this around and sort of make a, a assumption or on I'm going to say that the number of boxes that I see at resolution epsilon goes as the measurement resolution epsilon to the minus the dimension. Or I just simply take logs of both sides and turn this into a definition of this number up here. So our definition of dimension is, again, I'm sort of taking limits and then letting epsilon go to zero, and I'm looking at how the number of boxes changes as I vary epsilon. This is, and this is the metric circuit is sort of the rate of change of the counts. So here's, here's kind of a, a direct definition. I look at the log of the number of boxes at scale of epsilon, normalized by the scale I'm looking at, log of that. And then I just look at the, the ratio that I get as epsilon goes to zero. I'm kind of throwing, it's a very local motion. If you develop this more carefully, you have to talk about the mention of a particular point. In most of these chaotic invariant sets, it doesn't matter which point on the set you're going to mention the unit set. It takes a you know, couple days to develop that. So anyway, so here's our definition. In some sense, it's sort of the scaling of this number of filled boxes as a function of resolution. Okay, so let's go back to this example. And this is David Baker's map and see if we can make some sense of this definition. Okay, so we've already sort of argued, and after I've done the application of the uh, dissipated Baker's map, once I have two bands, two stripes I should say, if I do it twice I have four stripes, and so on. So I end up at the end application of the map with two DN stripes, and then they're each of thickness of how much shrinking is going on. So it could be a third or a quarter or something like that, that would be the shrinking, that's their size. So question is how many boxes do we need to cover the attractor when we're looking at it with resolution epsilon? Okay. So I mean here's the picture gets you oriented. I set epsilon equal to eight, an eighth here, and you can see that some boxes, some cells don't have pieces of the set, and some boxes do. And I just ask me to count up boxes that do I get the way to come up. But we can do this analytically. So just to make things a little bit easier, I'm going to uh, choose to take epsilon to be uh, some function of the shrinking. So that's sort of determining what the natural cell size would be. Um, so 
horizontally. So if I'm measuring with this resolution a to the n, that means I've applied the map n times. Horizontally, I'm going to have a to the minus n boxes. So the horizontal direction is always sort of contributing that many boxes. The question is, vertically, how many cells don't count? These are the same. So we just calculate out this function, n of epsilon. It's, it's the number of strips that we have, and they each contribute that many cells. So we end up with n of epsilon just being the algorithm, a over 2 to the minus n. OK, well, does this make sense? We just now plug, we just argued what the n of epsilon function is. We just plug it into the definition and calculate. Well, in this case, it's designed to be straightforward to explain. So here, we just plug in our F, n of epsilon. That's a over 2 to minus n, we just argued, over log of the resolution. Well, we're taking the step that resolution to be a to the n. So instead of having epsilon go to 0, the equivalent thing is applying the map n times and letting that go to infinity. That's the same thing as the resolution going to 0. Well, but notice, these, I have logs of these functions. The n pops out, just cancels out. So I end up with an expression, once I simplify things, where I don't have to take the limit because n just disappears. And I get with 1 plus log of a half over log of a. So that's claim. That is the dimension of the set we're looking at. That set. Okay, so for this particular simulation, I used 0 0.3. And you plug in here, and we get a dimension of about 1.6. Well, I'm not sure my intuition about dimension is so refined. I would know the difference between 1.7 and 1.4. So is this a good answer? Well, at least it's consistent, and certainly agrees in the extremes, right? So recall, remember when a goes to a half, we're back to the original area-preserving Baker's map, and that fills out the whole square. And notice that if I put in a equal a half, I have 1 plus 1. So d would be 2 in that case. Um, in the case I just turn off the y coordinate by setting a equal to 0, this just drops off and I have a dimension of 1. So at least the extremes work, and then the point, you know, the actual number you calculate is a little bit consistent with that. So, and you could play around with it. You know, watch the, uh, the, the set that you get from a simulation as a goes towards a half, and you'll see it gets thicker and thicker and thicker until it finally fills out. So this is a reasonable, I would argue, definition of dimension. Can so, I ask a question? Yeah. Um, so does it make sense to have a larger than one, where your area just blows up? It seems like you're going to get dimensions larger than two. Right. So there are some assumptions here that I'm making. So um, uh, yes. So first of all, it does make sense to have a be larger than a half. Um, in some sense, the, uh, the map is creating area. That's fine. But um, we keep it on the state space, which is the unit square. And it wraps around itself with um, that mod 1. And you'd have to do that also in the y coordinate to have it make sense. Otherwise, it's just going to be a set that gets larger and larger. So we need a compact object. So in that case, what you see is the, the map. Um, it's set so for, for the area preserving case, we stretch it exactly and shrink it exactly. So when we cut and stack, it exactly fills the, the unit square. Now what we're doing is when we stack the two pieces, we cut and stack, they overlap each other. So the signature of that is that the distribution of points on the unit square is no longer uniform. And so you can describe what's happening when A goes above a half um, as uh, in terms of you analyze more the probability distribution on the interval, it's still going to be the case that the points will fill out the square. And so the way we say that, and we'll get into this a little bit, we can say that the support of the distribution on the attractor would be two-dimensional. And then there is some structure in the distribution of where the, where the points can be. So, but there's nothing to keep you from changing that A parameter however you like. Um, well, it just, it's so just, would it, in a, an interpretation be that the um, that probability distribution is adding some somewhat of a third dimension? 
it's well, it's adding more structure to the attractor. So in this dissipative, right up to the area preserving side, the density of points along uh, in the invariant set is uniform, and that changes when you a goes above a half. Okay. But we're kind of jumping ahead. So so right now we're just talking about what's called the box counting dimension. Uh, we need to get into some information theory so we can start talking about the structure and distributions. But that's a couple weeks away. So great question, but we'll have to come back. Am I supposed to see how these equations extend into three dimensions right away? Oh, okay. So, so we're getting to the point where you should just start thinking about making your own maps. Right? So you can imagine there are maybe two different ways to extend the dissipative Baker's map to a, a volume. One would be that you have, let's say we have x, y, z coordinates. Um, I could have stretching happen on two coordinates and shrinking on one. Or the other way around, I could stretching on one and shrinking on two. So you should be able to go back to those equations I gave you and add a z, a third z equation, and, 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 and write off those two cases. And then you have to, okay, so now, and this dimension idea becomes even more important because you're getting to higher dimensions, right? Well, maybe in three dimensions you can argue which of the, those two cases I just gave can have higher dimensional sets. This a, or the, or the, maybe a new parameter b vary between zero and half. Yeah. So in that case, we get the Right, there would be a version of that that is volume, of, of each of those, in fact, that would be volume preserving, and then with the corresponding A and its new parameter, um, uh, the dimension would vary. But you can go through the same argument and do the same box counting dimension, and I think probably even do those analytically to get an expression as a function of the, um, uh, those two dissipation parameters, A and the new one. You can also vary the two, right? that, the, how much is stretched horizontally. You can vary that too, and that'll change it. So, so you really it should just play around with these things. Easy to, you know, if you have a question like that, write it out. Throw it into the, uh, probably one of those labs um, has enough code to do that. You could just, and then using that JML 3D visualizer, throw it up there and look around at it. Yeah. Okay, now the thing about the dissipated Baker's map, well, in any dimension, or the Baker's map is that there was this kind of clean separation between stretching horizontally and shrinking vertically. That it's almost like the two separate systems in a way. At least the x equation doesn't depend on the y equation. So the y equation doesn't depend on x because that's where you cut. But it's it's and, and so that's in some sense not realistic. So what I'm going to do is introduce another complication. So here's another map. It's called a cat map or more. Sophisticated toral automorphism, a toral automorphism. So what we're going to do is now uh, I'll give you the, the model where these directions of shrinking and expansion are no longer orthogonal. So in the state space, things become kind of mixing. At least the stretching and shrinking don't align with given coordinates. Okay. So so first I'll, I'll describe graphically what's going on, and then we'll, I'll, I'll explain the, the equations. So again, unit square. Then what we're going to do is take this. Uh, we're going to keep the origin fixed and take the, the, the one one coordinate and stretch it over so it's three two like that. And I'm actually going to do this. The first version of this will just be area preserving also. Not quite so obvious here. That's why the calculation is really important. Now what you did once I stretched out like this, I've labeled four different pieces and then fit them all back into the square again. So this will also be area preserving. Okay, so and what I'm doing here is I'm doing a mod one on the x coordinate and a mod one on the y coordinate. And that effectively shifts everything back down this way. But this is the way you think, it kind of expands out, that's the stretching part, and then my, my, my chopping or cutting now is a little more complicated. I mod one, so the B piece stays here, and this is upper. A is over here, C is down here, I have to stare at it a little bit more. Um, right, so, these, right, so the origin stays at the origin. 1, 1 goes up to 3, 2. And then these two points here, and then push it back into the unit square. So here is the mapping. It's not too complicated. It's just 
just this matrix 2, 1, 1, 1. So you just multiply that matrix times the, the two dimensional state, factor it out, and then mod one of both coordinates. And that gives you the new x and plus 1, y and plus 1. It's clear that the origin is a fixed point, that means 0. Okay. Now, this stability analysis is more, doing the calculations is more important. So we've got this. Well, it's easy to figure out what the Jacobian is. It's just that matrix. Right? The matrix of partial derivatives just is that matrix. So relatively straightforward then to calculate the eigenvalues, which I've done for you here. So the largest one is 3 plus square root 5 over 2. And the smaller one is 3 minus square root 5 over 2. Notice that the lambda 1, the larger one, is larger than 1. So that would be a stretching direction. And then the lambda 2 is less than 1, and that will be shrinking. So now the eigenvalues play, eigenvectors play a more important role. It's like what direction are we doing this? But again, you can calculate that out. And I can just sort of show you here on the original graphic where V1 more or less aligns along the stretching, what you guess is the stretching direction out, but V2 is not quite that. And then this V2 is orthogonal to that. Um, the determinant will tell us whether it's shrinking volumes or not. Well, if you actually multiply this out, lo and behold, it turns out to be one. So it's an area preserving that. So we're not losing any area. Also, this Jacobian matrix of partials doesn't have any uh, doesn't have any x or y dependence. So so this same stretching, the degree of stretching and shrinking, and the directions are uniform at every point in the unit square. Which is, again, that's the next thing <laughs> we'll do. We'll relax that. Uh, but first, um, what I want to do is demonstrate a little more uh, graphically what um, how the stretching and folding mechanism works. So what I have here, Okay, so <laughs> I'll have to explain the way this movie is going to play beforehand. Usually I have some control over this. With the, I'm not quite sure why I'm missing that. But anyway, so what you're going to see is a picture, an artist's rendering of Poincaré. And what I'm going to do is, right, so, so a picture of Poincaré digitized is a raster image, which means that there are a set of square array of pixels, and every pixel has a color, RGB. So what I'm going to do is apply the cat map to the location of each pixel. It'll, but the pixels will carry along, so those will be our states, and they'll carry along the color. The net effect, as you have already saw, as I do this, it will, we can kind of get a visual sense of how it's stretching, because we can recognize Poincaré. And you'll be able to see the stretching direction and the contracting direction. So, um, anything else I should show you? It kind of goes by a little bit quickly if I can't stop and start things. Um, yeah, so let me just start that up again. Okay. Now this is the discrete, okay, there. You're going to notice a little kind of beat. So what I'm doing is that's a discrete time map, and I'm doing a, an interpolation between those. So you can kind of see. Well, okay, first point is it only took three or four iterations before it just completely disappeared. So let me go back and start it over again. Okay, so the image, and then we'll see it stretching this way and shrinking that way. And about, this is only three or four iterations in. Point is completely lost. The, the pixels have been mixed so much by the stretching and folding back, it's just lost. It's kind of gray green mass is there. So that just shows you, like, I keep talking about this exponential uh, separation. Oh, what's going on here? Hmm. Some structure came back. But then it's mixed up again. 
So the first impression is this iter these iterate mappings completely destroy the structure. Now, these the recurrence of what are essentially ghosts of Poincaré um, have to do with the fact that the Jacobian is independent of position. So there was like two copies of Poincaré horizontally, three vertically there. Um, we're going to go exactly 240 iterations in this. Uh, if this one is halfway through 120. So there he is, he's come back again. So it's a little bit odd. And the an interesting and oddness of it has to do with this simplicity of the cat map having the Jacobian be position independent. And there are different order resonances, recurrences, if you will, of Poincaré. And it has to do with sub lattices of the pixels having different recurrence times. So if, if all the odd pixels come back in the same relative orientation after 120 iterations, you'll see what goes to Poincaré. The most important point is that very quickly, all the structures lost. So that's the main thing in scanning systems you're doing. And then there's special cases like this, where you have this recurrence of structures, which is not typical, but fun. So, um, oh, so you're back. All right. So in principle, so the mathematics would tell you, oh, it's just going to stretch forever, and so be constantly mixed. But in fact, when you do it on a finite lattice, it's really integer arithmetic, and it turns out that these chaotic mappings are essentially a kind of random but fixed permutation. If you do that enough times, the things will recur. So in fact, there's sort of a physics kind of nerdy joke behind all this. There was a very serious debate back in the late 19th century, early 20th century, about Boltzmann's theory of gases and how you could actually average over states. And so there was this idea that, oh, maybe chaotic systems are producing um, enough mixing that it's okay to interpret the microscopic behavior as if it was random. Then Poincaré kind of jumped in and said, oh no, there are these recurrence times. Therefore, there truly is no order coming back. But it turned out once they calculated out the recurrence times for a box of gas, this was many universe lifetimes. Anyway, so that's that. Okay, so now for a little dose of reality. This is going to be the, the Henan map. Uh, which is in that um, bifurcation diagram lab, the last one, two-dimensional map. And this is, I will argue, sort of or presented as being more realistic. In other words, if I just gave you a set of differential equations or plucked a two-dimensional map out of the air, this uh, is going to be a little more typical. So it's, it's going to do um, a similar type of stretching and folding. Um, this one, what it does is, um, and I have, so let's focus on this unit square here. And I've added the blue and orange arrows and orientations just to track what's going on. So basically, what the Henan map does, and I'll just give it to you. Again, it's a little hard to look at these unless there's something like the dissipated vapor map. Maybe a little hard to figure out what the actual transformation is. Typically, I just try it on a couple of different points, map lines around in some sense. And then there are two parameters here. So we have uh, so the x coordinate depends on the y coordinate, and then 1 minus ax squared. So A is a control parameter. And then the Y coordinate here is just B times Xn. Pictorially, what it does, it takes this unit square. I'm not putting any units here yet. We'll get to that. But it's basically just taking this, this unit square around the origin, sort of lifts it out of the plane, stretches it, folds it into a horseshoe, and then kind of turns it over and maps it back down around the origin. So notice where these arrows go. Now, as I'm doing this, I'm actually changing the orientation of the set. Notice also that the, 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 the image of this square, of all this, this set, doesn't fall in the original set. There'll be some point here, out, out, out around here, that actually going to march off to infinity. Um, and there's some areas that are just sort of thrown out. But the question is, where, you know, if you look at one step, there might be an invariant set somewhere in here. So you can set this, the intersection of the original set and the image of that set. So what does that look like? Well, first let's do a little analysis. You can calculate the Jacobian. 
Now, it may be a little clearer why I kept emphasizing the sort of previous examples, position independence. Now, the Jacobian does depend on the x coordinate of the current state, or where you are horizontally. So, whether things are stable or unstable, whether it's area preserving or not, could be state dependent. But we just have a relatively simple again. So, minus 2ax. Uh, one here because there's just that linear dependence of y. B shows up here due to the y uh, n plus one equation coefficient of xn, and there's no y dependence on y. Um, now we calculate the the determinant. Well, that's just the you know product of the diagonals minus product of the off diagonals. We just have a minus b here. So b in the equation controls the amount of area shrinking, and it's constant because we depend on position. And that minus sign is what I was talking about before. If you actually look at what the, what the mapping does, it actually twists the center around. If you had an orientation, it's going to flip that. So it's, it's you know, B less than 1, areas are shrinking, and then those areas are being flipped over each time. In the case of um, we can't appeal to analytical ways of calculating fractal dimension here because the state dependence really depends on what the, the orbit is. So one good thing to do is just simulate. So this is what you get. So now here's some coordinates. So plus or minus one and a half horizontally and then plus or minus a half vertically. So it's centered about the origin. And uh, you know you can kind of see that original horseshoe uh, action. Um, locally it looks like a line but then you know here it looks kind of thick, and you can kind of convince yourself that it might have that sort of layered, self-similar structure to it. Well, that's pretty easy to, to study. We do that numerically. So here are a series of steps where we zoom in. So here's the original attractor. And then I'm just going to focus on a little square like this to zoom in. So take that and blow it up to this next big square. So out here, at the larger scale, I see a thick line and two thin lines, and then when I blow it up around here, what looked like a thick line that breaks into a thick line and two thin lines. I'm saying this thinking you're squinting, and then I can blow this up and I see the same thing. So the thick line, two thin lines, and then of course this thick line is composed of a thick line and two thin lines all the way down. So you just keep zooming in and zooming in. Now of course if you do this numerically, the part of the state space you're looking at. Smaller and smaller and smaller, exponentially smaller. So, for me to get points in here, I have to iterate many millions of times to find a point that I can fall into this particular small part of the state space. But you can do this. You know, computing issues aside, you can just zoom in on these sets that way and see that they're so similar. Not uniformly so. There's some parts that are turning around and so on. So, it's a more complicated. Okay, so, so what we did is focus in on you know, kind of a very simple characterization of what's going on for underlying things. What's, what's the fundamental mechanism? And the claim is it's this exponential separation and exponential shrinking, and then somehow the sh stretching and shrinking happens so that the set maps back onto itself. So we have the possibility of having a tractor somewhere. So it could be a stable invariant set that within it has this constant exponential. All done with maps because it's easier for me to explain graphically what's going on. And you can also ask, well, how does this work in, in differential equations, the one we've been looking at? So I tend to switch back and forth again between discrete time maps, some of them are easy to illustrate certain ideas, and then the flows. Continuous time flows are nice because it's more geometry of the vector field, the flow field. Um, but we can, we can make a connection here. So, um, to get back to maybe give a better explanation of the, of the stretching and folding mechanism in the Whistler. Remember from the 3D uh, simulation demo, very flat in the plane here, and then goes unstable in Z, comes back down. But we'd like to understand a little more precisely what's going on. So there's some type of rubber sheet geometry where, as it's going in the XY plane, things are separating apart, and then it goes unstable stretching and then maps back down to itself. So suturing the two different pieces somewhere along here. So let me say that with a series of pictures. So what I'm going to do is imagine I cut this 
and stretch it out. And the start finish line that we use when we're talking about the return map. So basically what's going on is we have this rubber sheet. This is sort of, you might think of this as the local view. If you were in the attractor itself, what you'd see is that everything just moving away. You can't look outside. You don't see that you're embedded in three dimensions. You're in this pseudo two dimensional thing and everything's just kind of moving away. So if A and B, the outside edges of that band where you can go to part, sort of one time around, that can be stretched to, to, to two units wide. Then what I do is I pull the sheet back up and identify the B ends, B prime and B double prime, together, hold it this way. So that's the suturing part, and then to make it compact, I stretch it around and then identify all the Bs at the same point and then identify A and B prime. So that's kind of a, that's a first approximation of what this rubber sheet geometry is. Again, you can go into that lab, put in a, the, the Rissler equation, and use the 3D viewer to zoom in where this, this suturing happens to convince yourself that's, that, 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 that this topological description is a good approximation. I say an approximation, it's not quite right. It turns out that B and B prime are actually offset a little bit in the actual crystal attractor. So you should go, go look for that. Figure out where this is just an approximation. OK, so now there's another way we can uh, look at um, the stretching and folding. And now I want to uh, show you some uh, simulation demos. First of the Rustler and then the Lorenz. Patience as I get this started up. So the first one be the Rustler. Standard parameter values. Uh, time step. So now it sort of comes up on my thing. Just getting it into the normal location now. It's <coughs> good. Okay, so now this is what I'm doing, <laughs> just so you can see. So all I did is set it up so we have one solution here. It's about 10,000 steps. The, the kind of standard parameters we've been looking at. And um, now what I'm going to do is um, OK, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to start off 100,000 initial conditions really, really close together. They're really just separate simulations, but I'll plot them all here. And then we have this kind of reference trajectories so we know where the attractor is. And we're just going to follow that for some period of time. So the way you should think about this is imagine you had some experiment you were doing, and because of the finite resolution of control you have, you don't exactly know what the initial state is. But that could be some little fuzzball in space. It's all close together. So here, it's the blue right here. Okay, they're all really close together. Um, they, they did stretch up in the z direction. Now the first thing you notice is there, there is a little bit of separation along one direction. So the spherical blob is now turning into a line. And you can see also the kind of stretching. There's a little bit of shrinking too. It depends on where you are. But now already, three times around, that line is almost across the full racetrack, the full band. Now it's completely across. So it went around six times. So they were, so to give you some sense of scale here, this is plus or minus 15 and zero to 50. I started that initial 100,000 points in a little ensemble that in the same units were 0.1 or tiny foot long. So just a few times around, that small little uncertainty is now blown up to be anywhere on the attractor. So if you tried, for example, try to use the information, oh, I prepared the system. In this particular state, 
It's just a little bit of variation that just in a few, you know, natural time units, a few seconds, if you will, I can't tell where the state is going to be radiating. Notice for this attractor, though, there is some kind of structure still remains, but it's, 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 it's a band that goes across radially. So what happens in the Rustler is that there's phase information that is preserved. If I know the initial phase, basically the angle around the z-axis, that gets preserved. The radial position, though, I'm having the stretching and folding, stretching and folding, so that information is lost very quickly. So the radial position is not predictable, or very quickly becomes not predictable, but the phase information is pretty well maintained. And that's a product of, well, I guess they're both a product of the actual global geometry of the track. Difficult to analyze in the system compared to uh, look at the simulation and see how the geometry of the tractor interacts with the spreading of the dots. Okay, so that's Rustler. Now let's look at the, the lens. Again, contrast. Just on the last time we listened to them, we heard there was a difference. That that. Tone in the midst of the noise with the rustler exactly is exactly this preservation of phase information. That's why we could hear it. There's a lot of periodic uh, regular uh, energy there. It's on a change system. Okay, so there. Chronical position, and I'm going to do the, I'm going to do the, the same uh, dot spreading experiment. So uh, this time I'll do uh, sixty thousand initial points. They're, they're basically. 60,000 sets of three dimensional differential equations. Amazing what you can do this. At least for me, I don't have to do machine programming to get anything like this to work. Okay, so now um, let me say a couple things. So, what I'm going to do here is so we have x and y, the z coordinate, um, just to give you some sense of scale. So, this is plus or minus 30 here on the two. X and Y axes, and then Z coordinate goes from zero to about 50. What I'm going to do is start off an ensemble with 60,000 initial positions that the radius of the little fuzzball is a 0 0.05. Really tiny. It's going to start somewhere around here. And then we'll just let it go. Okay, here it is. It's a little bit small, but I started very close together, so it'll get a little bit easier. It's that little blue blob. Well, I started way out here. It kind of got injected near this, this elliptic fixed point. It's mostly just cycling around. You can see there's a little bit of stretching along one dimension. We're getting a little string out of this. The ball is now turning into a string. Um, and you can see that it was basically just moving out away from this unstable fixed point. Um, and then stretched the uh, what call phase shape here. It stretches like that. So that was a thousand times steps. I'll do another. Thousand time steps. Keep going. Okay. Now it comes down along the z-axis. Notice there's a huge amount of spreading, but then it gets re-injected kind of close to that fixed point on the other side. And now suddenly it's on either side. And so we get this huge amount of stretching. As soon as that ensemble is stretched into a line, such that the line stays on one side and goes the other side. This, things are kind of close. This kind of local picture of a little bit of spreading is making sense. And then once that filament stretches over sort of both sides of the z-axis, um, it just now now it really starts stretching a huge amount, cutting and stretching, cutting and stretching. So then the number of lines here is going to every 
sort of adjacent time. Lorenz time unit will double. And so we can just keep doing this. And one question is, what does the, the ensemble look like? You do this long enough, and that's most of it, an issue for patience. Now, the fact that we're seeing lines here means there's a little bit of memory of that original one-dimensional structure. You can see that there are other sets of points around here that are getting kind of just randomly spread out. You can also see that there's, there's kind of oscillation, kind of high density sort of moving around. Well, if you keep doing this longer and longer, I'll do it a couple more times, this sort of little bit of memory, the phase memory here, the, the, the original line structure, that just completely disappears. It gets this more or less uniform density of points. So again, just to emphasize the obvious, I started 60,000 points, you know, very, very close together, and just a few cycles around, maybe you know, five, 10 cycles around, all that initial information we have about the location of the state is lost. It can be anywhere on this graph. Hey, hey Jim. Yeah. Um, so I don't remember for the Lorenz what the, uh, uh, the Jacobian looked like, but is that what you would use to determine sort of local stability and instability in this thing? Yes, it you seems would. like the dots will stay together at certain points and then be flushed apart at others. Yes, right. Right, so, so even with the, uh, the Rustler example, what you were seeing visually is that, depending upon where you were on the attractor, there might be some, some stretching that might be compensated later on. So it does depend on where you are. So the Jacobian is very much state dependent in these cases. And we're gonna come back to that, maybe not today, but that's, we're gonna come up with a way of averaging the eigenvalues of the Jacobian to be measures of sort of long-term average stretching, long-term average shrinking. And this is going to lead to this classification scheme I mentioned at the beginning. So maybe one more time here just to show you it really does converge. So visually, the distribution of points it doesn't even look like it's changing that much anymore. Remember before, it actually looked like it was flowing because it was kind of localized. And now it's as it smears out we're getting close to a visual impression of what, the, what we call the sort of long-term distribution on the attractor is. And there's a notion of an invariant distribution that comes back to itself under the flow. So this is some approximation for 60,000 points of, of that. And so it basically just looks the same. You know, it looks like it's denser here, but in fact, if you remember the geometries, I have two sheets. So of course it'll look a little bit denser there. But pretty much the density is, 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 is becoming very smooth, and well behaved. So we're going to come back next week and talk about probability distributions. So what I'm doing today is trying to give you this notion that we're starting with these deterministic systems, showing how they're producing these complicated orbit sets. In a sense, what the origin of randomness is and why we have to use probability distributions. And I just started using, describing things that way. So even for these deterministic systems that are chaotic, statistical and probabilistic analysis is necessary. Sometimes it throws a lot away. We still are interested in the geometry and topology of the attractor, but it's both part of the analysis. Okay, so. I think what I'll do is uh, just describe, um, maybe this will be a little bit of an introduction um, to how we're going to do this. <coughs> measuring how unpredictable systems are. And then I'll, I'll just stop there for today. So, so how are we going to quantify this instability? Well, in some ways, the, the, the formal mathematics is not so different from what we did with uh, the argument for fractal dimension, the Fox Hamming dimension. Um, but, but here's the basic geometric picture. So we have some initial condition here called x0, some dimensional state space. Think of the Whistler lorenz the dot spreading experiment. And we have this reference or fiducial trajectory, okay, well enough. And what we're interested in is how small perturbations from this, how nearby states evolve. So the idea is, which the dot spinning experiments motivate, is that even if I start with a very small separation, that that separation will grow in time. 
and I can make a model of that. I'm going to assume that this length of this, this displacement vector is going to be uh, rho at some exponential range. So I'm modeling this in a sense with e to the lambda times t. And so that the length of the separation vector at some later time grows exponentially as a function of the original size. So this is our Hans assumption. And what we're interested in actually is that exponent, just like we were interested in dimension before. So I'm going to kind of turn this assumption around and start thinking about how I can monitor the growth of these perturbation vectors from an original separation. So again, just doing the algebra, taking some logs and stuff, we see that this growth rate, lambda, is the time average, 1 over t, times the log of the ratio of the initial separation size to the final. So this is called, I'll turn it into a real definition here, these are called, the, this is called the Lyapunov characteristic exponent. It's actually introduced by the Russian uh, mathematician Lyapunov in the 1920s or so. Um, so here's the real definition. So we have, we're averaging over time log of 1 over t, sorry, 1 over t times log, I use base 2, you'll see why in a second, the logarithm of this ratio of these lines. So very simple. We have this picture that we start very close, and things separate out. Now there are issues, I can't let t go too long, because then I reach the size of the attractors. So what I do is, my little calculus thing, I let my little epsilon separation here go to zero, and then I take the infinite time limit. In a sense, it's, it's, it's kind of a local measure of separation. Now, when you do this, in fact, the definition I'm using here, there are a couple different definitions. This definition is close to something you could imagine coding up. Right? If I have a simulator, you could do the dot spreading experiment. Well, this is just for two dots. And just kind of on that, kind of, as you're following one trajectory, make little perturbations and see how much they grow and average that growth rate by taking the law of the ratio. These are, in an n-dimensional system, this, this displacement is a vector. But what happens is that this vector aligns with the most unstable direction. So the way to think about that is if there's any contracting direction, any component of this displacement vector in that is going to shrink. So that will go away. What's going to be left will be a vector pointing in the most unstable direction. So this is called the maximum the often of characteristic exponent. And it is the sort of average rate of growth of these small variations. So let's think about what this means. I kind of be just a little more precise uh, than the way I've described some things before. Um, imagine we have some measurement resolution epsilon. This will be the size of those little displacement vectors. And I'm going to measure how much we know about the location, the log of that resolution. Log base two. So minus log base two, this resolution will give us the amount of information we have. So allow me to use the term information informally here. If I was measuring the position of the state to one part in a thousand, then I'd have about 10 bits of information. We'll come back and actually define what that means and make a connection and introduce information to you. But this is it's like a, a decibel scale for measuring resolution, a logarithmic scale of resolution. And now we have some system that is amplifying things at some rate. So what we're going to think about that is it's actually throwing information that I've very precisely specified in my system, but now all those small variations I didn't have control over, that's being spread out, so I'm losing information. I don't know where the system is, I have to measure it again to recover it. So we have this information loss rate, lambda, or the growth rate of these small errors, and we can kind of cobble together a quantitative estimate of the average amount of time until I can't predict the system. And this is just basic, I'm just saying, uh, you know, some simple expressions here, what we saw in the dot spreading experiment. I know where it is, you know, uh, five cycles around, ten cycles around, it could be anywhere on the track. So, and as a first approximation to that time of unpredictability, it's just the initial information divided by the rate of loss of and that gives you a time scale. Right? This is units of information, it's rate of loss of information per time up back up to the top. So if the loss rate, the simple case, like, like 
Baker's transformation, if lambda was one, every second, right, every iteration of cycle, I lose one bit of information. My measurement resolution, the information I get from that, I lose one bit of that. And then I'm measuring one part in a thousand, then that gives me about 10 bits of information, and therefore, if I'm losing one bit per second, it's only 10 seconds later that I can't determine where the state is. Simple enough. Now, that's probably uh, intuitive given what we talked about to get here, but now imagine that I convince my NSF program manager to give me like a huge expensive instrument that is a million times more accurate, or say, just say a thousand times more accurate. So in other words, my epsilon goes from 10 to the minus 3 to one part in a million. How much longer can I predict the system? Well, just go through the formula here. I get 20 bits of information about the local state, and I'm losing one bit per second. My time of unpredictability is only double. So I have a thousand times more accurate instrument, but I can only predict the system in about 10 seconds. So that's sort of the power of this exponential separation. Basically, at any scale of uncertainty, it's going to be amplified up to macroscopic scale and determined. Uh, well, force you to measure again if you've lost information. Okay, well, we'll stop there. Um, and then we'll, next lecture on Tuesday, I'll talk about how to generalize this idea of the largest layout model exponent measures instability to also capture stability. And that will use this classification scheme some average sense of what chaos looks like in arbitrary dimension. So, questions? Yeah. Uh, I mean, kind of going back to what you said yeah, earlier, but like, it seems like the kind of modular nature of these tractors almost puts a, a limit on your uncertainty, like a, a maximum. Mm -hmm. Right. I guess. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there are different questions of, of what you would want to predict. And maybe you don't really mind that the long-term behavior is a little bit chaotic. In fact, it turns out our heartbeats are not regular. And that is for a very good physiological reason, because our physiology can adapt to uncertain circumstances. It turns out if it's exactly periodic, you're having a heart attack. <laughs> so it's not good. right? So, But now, you don't want the heartbeat to be completely irregular and doing all the strange stuff. It's got to be you know, in some part of, think of the state space of the heart, there's probably some physiologically useful region where it's regularly pumping blood. But you don't care on the micro scale that it's a little bit unstable. It might even be helpful. But if you were designing the heart in the vector field for this semi-stable, maybe a little bit chaotic oscillation, you want, it'd mostly be stable. You wouldn't want it to freak out and go off to infinity at the same time. So, so, so there's, from a large scale, there, there can be predictability. It's all going down to some invariant set around the origin. That may be good, and maybe engineering a system, and that's good enough. Right? So there are different levels you can ask these questions of predictability. The, the spectrum of layoff and object spells we'll talk about next time will let you capture that even larger scale notion of predictability, how stable these things are. Great. Okay. So um, we have a few things to, to finish up from last lecture. Um, Remember last lecture, we were trying to delve down into uh, this stretch and fold mechanism, trying to understand how it is that systems can recurrently produce instability. So we went through that in a number of different examples, um, different uh, maps and flows with sort of the final, maybe key demo of the dot spreading. That's sort of the, the paradigm you should have in mind what these flows are doing or what even the discrete time maps are doing. Initially close, initial conditions get spread out exponentially fast, right? So you're the experimentalist, you prepare the system in what you think is a known state, and because of the very structure of the flows, the built-in nonlinearities take that initially precise information and amplify fluctuations that you had no control over until finally the, the initially close states could be anywhere on the attractor and you've lost the ability to predict. So we ended last lecture talking about a way to quantify that. And it's not really so different from the way we looked at it visually. And this was using the Lyapunov characteristic exponent. 
So we took two initially close trajectories and the states and then followed them along their trajectory. They had a small separation and we simply monitored how that small separation grew in time. We made this exponential growth model of that and turned that around to define the, what was the maximal Lyapunov exponent. So again, the idea is we have some sort of trajectory flowing around in our invariant set. And then uh, as we're following the trajectory at each moment in time, we're sort of looking very, very close and looking how small separations grow. So last time we only talked about two points separated by some distant vector. And I kind of argued that, well, if there, was, if there were directions in that separation where there was contraction of the state space, then those would shrink. And then this, this arrow would actually align with the most unstable direction. And then the rate of growth of that along that unstable direction um, would be this measure of exponential growth of instability. So maximal Lyapunov exponent. And the way to kind of uh, uh, solidify our intuitions about that, we talked about the, a way of actually measuring. Now that we have this number lambda, the maximal Lyapunov exponent, it gives us the, the, the exponential rate of losing information about the initial condition. We can turn that into an estimate of the average time a system becomes unpredictable. If we measure the state within some accuracy, we think of the Lyapunov exponent as the rate of loss of accuracy per unit time. So I went through the example. If you can measure the state to one part in a thousand, and the Lyapunov exponent was, had an amplification of a factor of two loss every second, it was only, then it would be only 10 seconds until we could, unpre could not predict the system. Um, I pointed out that if we got a much more expensive instrument that was a thousand times more accurate, could measure the state to one part in a million, that only doubled our time, the prediction horizon from 10 seconds to 20 seconds. So it's so a multiplicative factor increase or an exponential factor in the size of your grants you need to buy the good expensive instruments leads to only a linear increase in the time to unpre unpredictability. So that's sort of the, in some sense the power of this constant exponential growth. It's hard to overcome that. So what I want to do today is finish up this discussion of, of chaotic behavior and how we measure it. And this in some sense is amortizing all the work we put in so far. So um, in particular, what we're going to do is start to, to, to uh, uh, expand this notion of measuring stability to how we also measure, uh, measure uh, instability and stability together. And then we'll come up with a way of going from these various measures to estimate dissipation rate, information production rate, even the fractal dimension. We'll end with a classification scheme that gives us a little hint of what chaos looks like in higher dimensions than we can visualize, more than three dimensions. And then I'll actually give you a, the proper definition of chaos. So kind of clean things up um, in terms of our understanding the way and the ways we analyze chaotic behavior. Okay, so the, the main idea here is very similar to the maximal Lyapunov exponent. So now I want you now think in some n-dimensional dynamical systems. Lorenz and Russell are three-dimensional dynamical systems. And we're going to start with the same picture. We have some trajectory that's moving around on an attractor. So we have this reference trajectory. And then instead of, like we did before, looking at a single displacement, two initial conditions with some separation, I want you to imagine that there's an n-dimensional basis attached to it, attached to this fiducial trajectory. And it gets carried along. So at each moment in time, we can look at how those basis vectors normalized initially, how they stretch, how they rotate. And that's going to be the basis of measuring instability and stability. So this is called the, <clears throat> the spectrum of Lyapunov characteristic exponents. And the definition doesn't look so different um, notationally, but you should, it's really trying to describe having this little orthonormal basis attached and it gets carried along. I mean, if you jumped ahead a little bit and we'll be more precise later on with some examples. You kind of, I mean the goal here is really just to look at the local stretching and shrinking. And you think, oh, well if I had the equations of motion, I could write down the Jacobian and I should be able to do this. So there's, a, there's another formulation of this that's essentially equivalent that does that when you have the equations of motion. What I'm going to talk about here is this more geometric way of thinking about the, space, the basis vectors rotating and stretching and shrinking that in principle you could use, say, on data if you didn't know what the equations were. So 
Okay, so let's just stay with this kind of geometric view. So for fiducial trajectory, we start at some moment in time with these small separation vectors. So you can imagine there are three neighboring uh, initial conditions, but let's just now talk about the evolution of the, the, the deviation vector. And then over time, this, you know, can, in the general case, the, this basis is going to rotate as it moves through the state space. And then some of the basis vectors will grow in length and, and some might shrink. And in fact, kind of along the trajectory, there will always be one that kind of lies along the trajectory. And on average, it doesn't shrink or uh, grow because of this recurrence. I'll come back to that. <clears throat> okay, so anyway, so that's the picture. So definition, Lyapunov characteristic exponent spectrum, if we have an n-dimensional dynamical system, there'll be these n directions that we can stretch and shrink in, and therefore there'll be n rates. Uh, we're going to do uh, an ordering so that lambda 1 is the largest, but it's kind of arbitrary, down to the smallest. And then I'm going to define the ith characteristic exponent to be the exponential growth rate of the initial separation distance for that vector. So I'm starting in a particular direction and letting this thing rotate out, but I'm really just interested in its length and how the lengths have grown or shrunk. So it's the same definition, and then we do a time average. So again, we're looking locally, so in this definition we let these separation vectors go to zero in principle, and then we do a time average of them. Okay, and then again, so this is just saying we have a, a sort of orthonormal basis. A, you know, a crude way to implement this as an algorithm would be you'd start off with these little vectors, you'd have to choose some period of time, some number of steps of your integration method, you'd stop, do this measurement of change of length, and then reorthonormalize the basis and let it go again. So as an algorithm, there might be some pro estimation parameters you have to add, but the idea is fairly clear here. It's just a basis rotating along. We're going to ignore the rotation aspect. This is an interesting question. People have tried to develop complex Lyapunov characteristic exponents to give the average rate of rotation, but we won't get into that. We're just going to follow the stretching and shrinking of these basis vectors. Now, why do we want to do this? Well, it's clear we're picking up more information than just looking at one, Lyapunov exponent. Although if we were interested in just a simple demonstration that a system was unpredictable, then we, we, we could just look at the maximal one and not do all of this. But there's a lot we can get from the full spectrum. So, so in, in a way, what's happening is we have this trajectory. It's winding around the attractor, and we're kind of sampling the local stabilities and instabilities. And then we get this kind of average, these average quantities back out. So why do we want to do this? Well, here's one reason. It gives us a kind of formal way of thinking about what's going on in the state space. If we were in the frame of this fiducial trajectory, then sort of nearby, we can think of the state space as splitting into directions of exponential separation from us. Those will correspond to positive Lyapunov exponents. And then there'll be other directions where perturbations are exponentially converging to us, and that's going to be associated with negative Lyapunov exponents. Simple enough. So, in fact, there are various uh, uh, rigorous results that establish this sort of mapping between negative exponents and the kind of stable manifold along a trajectory, and positive exponents being associated with the unstable manifold. So this is the connection between the sort of average quantities and this organization of the state space. Yeah, Chris. Uh, quick question. So is there some analogy between the Lyapunov exponent and eigenvalues of nature? Yes, yes. Um, I won't develop that here. Maybe I'll put up a reference, or that might, might be in some of the reading. Right, there's another way to calculate this when you have the equations of motion. Right, and this goes back to... Uh, calculating the Jacobian, and then evaluating the Jacobian along the trajectory, x of t. And you do this each time. If the Jacobian depends on the state, then you have to do this. Then you have the Jacobian, and then what you do is, it's actually the eigenvalues of the symmetric part of the Jacobian. So maybe we can come back to that. I mean, that, that would be sort of a sidebar. Okay. At, the, at this point, I just want us to think about kind of the motivations and, 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 and how we're going to interpret these things, because this is going to actually lead to our classification system. This this one-to-one -one correspondence between negative exponents, positive exponents, corresponding to this kind of formal picture of, uh, you know, this kind of canonical picture of nearby things are spreading out and contracting. 
So sometimes you'll, you'll read in the literature, this is called the hyperbolic structure. And it's very much, it goes back to the simplest example, at least the, at least the kind of the, the picture is like the fixed point, like a hyperbolic fixed point where we had stable manifold, unstable manifold. Now the idea is that's happening locally. You can ask questions like, well, okay, if I have this unstable direction, unstable manifold, what does that correspond to on the tractor? Well, the short answer is pretty simple. The things we've been looking at, if I say, oh, here is the Lorenz tractor, or here is the Rüssler tractor, what we're looking at is the, called the global unstable manifold. That's this, the subspace in which everything is spreading out. So that, and I, and I use the word global because this picture and all the Apanov exponents are defined as a local average over time. They're useful numbers because the trajectory winds over the whole attractor and samples all the states in the attractor, so it's a good average. Um, but this, this picture here is a little bit, yeah, it's, again, it's just kind of a local picture. But the state space is always kind of splitting into these two subspaces, yeah. Um, so two theories from that mm -hmm. architecture analogy. But in this case, our directions that we're measuring this one are essentially arbitrary, like, or at least we're inspired. Is that true? Or? Correct. So they right the right. So you have to make some choice. Exactly what is the orientation of this? So so what the kind of mathematics behind it shows that it it's if if you're on a single invariant set, then it doesn't matter. These the, the vectors will eventually line up in the right direction. So that was why I was kind of hinting at if I have the if I choose one basis vector that I just look at its length and let it kind of move around, any orthogonal directions contract, and any component it has in orthogonal directions of contraction will just exponentially collapse. So in a sense, and you can see that when you, if you play, make a little simulation, no matter which angle you start with, it'll line up right to be within that unstable manifold. So, so this positive, the direction of instability, which would be associated with the positively off and off exponent, will always lie inside the attractor. So now this is good, right? We have these numbers, uh, and there are a number of things we can extract from the spectrum of the Apanov exponents. It's not everything, it's just a set of n numbers, right? I mean, for, one of the things you can't get out of this is the difference between the topological differences, right? The Lorenz has two holes, <laughs> and the Russell has one. But that's an interesting question, but we're not going to, can't get to that from the Lyapunov exponents, but we can get some distance. So, so for example, um, we can calculate the average shrinking of the state space, or what I call the dissipation rate. So we're mostly looking at these systems like the Lorenz and Rüssler, where state space volumes are shrinking. And I already kind of argued before, kind of recapping Lorenz's 63 paper, that he calculated the divergence of the vector field. In his case, for his equation to turn out, it didn't depend on the state. So he just had this whole volume shrinking down. But we can get this directly from the uh, spectrum of the Apanov exponents in the following way. So remember, the divergence of this vector field is just the sum of the partial derivatives, uh, partial f, partial x, partial y, partial z. It's really just the trace of the Jacobian. Okay, so the diagonal in the Jacobian, the first partials. Okay, and then I can do a time average of this. Lorenz's case, it didn't depend on time, so this came out. We had a constant rate of volume decrease. And you can show that the, you sum up the, all the exponents from 1 to n. That is this dissipation rate. Sort of makes sense. We're looking at the, you know, locally, along the trajectory that's sampling over the whole attractor, we're looking at amount of exponential separation, stretching, and shrinking. And if it's an attractor, somehow the net shrinking directions have to overcome any net stretching, separation. So that's it. So this is going to be the, a quick way. First thing you can do is figure out this dissipation rate. Again, that's the hypervolume contraction rate, exponential rate. Um, these each take a little while to develop, so I'll just kind of give you the definition, mostly, mostly just to motivate why we think about the spectrum of the Apanov exponents. We talked in the case of the dissipative Baker's map, this concept of fractional dimension, fractal dimension sometimes called. You can get that also from the spectrum of the Apanov exponents, how philo doish the, the, the invariant set is. Uh, it's a little more complicated expression. So the dimension of the attractor is there's an integer component and a fractional component. So the integer component, it's basically related to the number of positive exponents, except there's a twist, and it comes this way. What, what I do is I have the whole spectrum of exponents, 1 to n, and I start adding them up. 1 added to 2 added to 3. I sum them up. And as soon as it turns negative, 
at that i, I back off one. And that's going to be my integer component of the dimension j. So start summing them up. If it's chaotic, they'll be first one will be positive, next one might be positive, then a zero, then a negative, then a really negative one. That compensates and makes the, the sum up to that point suddenly turn negative. You stop there, and that's going to be this integer component. And then the fractional component is just how much, how, how, how close to zero that sum was just before it went negative over the next exponent. There's kind of a competition between this, this will now be negative, the next exponent, j plus 1, will be slightly negative. And so that gives you the fractional component. So there's a certain you know, number of di directions that are stretching. That's being compensated. It's an attractor by some amount of shrinking. And it's the fractional component is just a, the, the kind of net competition between the positive directions and this next negative one, negative um, shrinking factor. Okay. So now a little proviso here. This has been used for many, many years, but it's still a bit of an open question how generally it applies. But that's a first cut. It's not so bad. Uh, finally, and this is mostly trying to set us up for what we're going to be doing very soon, is thinking about chaotic dynamical systems as information generators. So we're going to be moving pretty soon, maybe two weeks into information theory. And there's a notion of a dynamical system as an information generator. It's different from the Oppenhoff exons, but there's a relationship. So, so let's call this the entropy of a chaotic attractor. It's a noted H mu. Some, more technically, it's called the kolmogorov sinai entropy, introduced in the late 50s. And that, the sort of net information production rate in the units here are bits per second, is just the sum of the positive exponents. So this will... We'll make a more direct connection back to this concept of dynamical system producing information. This is actually, uh, as we'll see, is actually a global measure of how the state space gets picked up, stretched, and folded, and put back into itself. What's interesting about this result is that we're averaging, summing up these locally average quantities. Okay. So... Now, okay, so, so now we have the spectrum, and there are these uh, quantities, dissipation rate, fractal dimension, information production rate, uh, that we can immediately pull out of that to give us various interpretations of how chaotic a system is, or whether it's chaotic or not. Um, there are also some constraints that uh, uh, we know ahead of time uh, that let, let us get a picture of what arbitrary dimension attractors can do. Okay, so we'll talk about building up to this classification. Okay, so we're going to talk about attractors. So first of all, we're going to have this signature here, the n Lyapunov exponents ordered this way, lambda 1's the largest, lambda 2 the next. So if we're look, interested in attractors, we know the dissipation rate has to be negative. Volumes have to be shrinking. Okay, and that's a constraint on the sum of the all the exponents. That sum has to be negative because that's what d was. At least that's. So the net result is at least one in the signature, at least one Lyapunov exponent is going to be negative. And if we only have one, it had better be large enough negative that it compensates any other positive ones because the net volume has to contract. Um, this also means that the dissipation rate has to be larger than this sum of positive exponent or entropy rate. So what we're trying to do is characterize the constraints on these numbers, Lyapunov exponents, and see if we can't come up with a classification. Also, in addition, if, if, the, if the invariant set that we've got the Lyapunov exponents for is not a fixed point, then the flow along the trajectory, think of that little difference vector, asymptotically doesn't grow or shrink. And one way to think about that is that imagine on a limit cycle, I have a little displacement vector that's tangent to the trajectory in the direction of the flow. It's going to come back to itself, and it better be the same size. So it can't either get ahead of itself or get behind. Otherwise, of course, it was getting ahead of itself. It would go off to infinity. Or if when I came back, it got smaller and smaller and smaller, I'd have a fixed point. It's kind of argument by contradiction. So anyway, one of these, it, as long as the, it, it's some kind of time-dependent behavior, not a fixed point, one of the exponents has to be zero. And then if the attractor is chaotic, then we need some degree of instability. So one of them has to be positive. Okay, so now we have these various things we're looking at. 
attractors. Dissipation rate has to be uh, positive, means at least one exponent has to be negative. If it's, if, it's, if it's a flow with a dynamical behavior, one of them has to be zero, and then if it's chaotic, one of them's got to be greater than zero. Okay, so now we can actually start looking in higher dimensions. So here's the classification scheme from one-dimensional flows up to four-dimensional. Remember before, the four-dimensional ones I didn't know about, but now I can start to tell you what's sort of new here, and it gives us a little bit of insight as to what's going on. So remember, one dimension, all we had were fixed points, and those, as in variant sets, there's only one kind that's stable, a stable fixed point, and it's, the Alpinoff spectrum has one exponent, and that's got to be negative because it's an attractor. The dissipation rate has to be negative. Okay. Uh, two dimensions. Well, fixed points, but now we have two dimensions. Both perturbations away from the fixed point are exponentially damped, therefore both exponents are negative. We have this new behavior in two dimensions, the limit cycle. Well, it's stable, therefore I need at least one of these to be negative, and it's a flow. It's time dependent by the argument I just gave. The other exponent has to be zero. Okay, same thing in three dimensions. Fixed point is stable in all three directions, therefore the corresponding Lyapunov exponents have to be negative. We have a limit cycle. Now we have two negative exponents and then one zero exponent along the direction of the of the limit cycle, okay? Now the torus comes in. It has one negative exponent being an attractor, but the signature has two zero exponents. Why? Well, one of them has to be zero because it's a flow. So, that, so, that, so the, dif the differences along the trajectory don't grow or shrink on average. Then the other one is, is on the surface of the donut now that we're imagining. Perturbations don't damp or grow. If I just perturb, the, the orbit just a little bit, then those two now neighboring trajectories are just going to follow each other around. It, it's a direction of neutral stability. And that has it fill out the surface of the torus. And then chaotic attractor, like the Russell and Lorenz, negative exponent and large one because it's attractor. Exponent associated with the direction of flow is zero, and then we have the positive exponent. So this is why you have to go to three dimensions in flows to see chaotic attractor. Those constraints I just gave you mean this is the first time we get to have a plus zero minus signature, where we can have a plus exponent. Okay, so that's all familiar. That's just a summary. Um, now, what about four dimensions? Well, let me not take anything in lower dimension can be here. I'll just show you what can, what's new. So this is one of the uses of this. We can now start to imagine, perhaps in a slightly formal way, what these new kinds of behavior could be in four dimensions. Um, well, we can have, well, limit cycles and a torus. We can also have a three torus. That is, again, a large negative exponent and then three neutral directions. Well, one along the direction of the trajectory and then two neutral ones. So this is filling out some sort of solid three torus in four dimensions. I have difficulty imagining what it is, but I can work with this. <laughs> this I can interpret. <laughs> so these things exist. Um, uh, chaotic two torus. Okay, so this looks like the torus up here, except I've added on a positive exponent. So now I've got some sort of donut surface and there's yet another direction in which things are exponentially separating and unstable. Again, I'm somewhat challenged to visualize an example of this. You can do this in these cases. If you have a four-dimensional system you're interested in, like that uh, Rusler hyperchaos system that's in the favorite flows lab. You can take cross-sections through that, through the four-dimensional space to see a three-dimensional object. And you can actually convince yourself that, that well, actually, it's this. <laughs> so the final one, sort of new kind of chaos is, again, we have to have a large negative exponent, zero exponent along the flow, and then we have two positive exponents. So again, what does that mean? That means in the four-dimensional neighboring space, there are going to be two directions in which I'm getting exponential amplification. So, so the hyperchaos, four-dimensional flow in that lab is this guy. And you can take cross-sections through the data and sort of convince yourself that it actually has. Uh, also, higher dimension, remember? Um, the fractal dimension depends on the number of positive exponents before you sum to get negative. So this guy will look three-dimensional plus some fraction, depending upon how strong that negative exponent is. So. Okay, and so on. I mean, you can just sort of 
work this out. There's actually a nice systematic classification scheme that now gives us at least some, okay, okay again, it's just based on a few numbers, <laughs> but it does let us now imagine in any dimension what kinds of behavior that can be. You know, stable, I mean, attracting chaotic behavior or quasi-periodic behavior. A particular application might have more detailed questions, but this is a nice start. And if you were looking at a turbulent fluid, well, a turbulent fluid is an infinite dimensional system because each volume element is its own little dynamical system. It's over a three-dimensional domain. I have an infinite number of degrees of freedom there. Well, but it's also dissipated. When you pump energy in, the thing heats up and so on. So people have been interested in, if you looked at various turbulent flows, in principle, infinite dimension, but you can show that the system contracts down onto something that can actually measure this dissipation rate, D. But what dimension is it? So people, have, depending upon the parameters in the flow and what kind of flow you have, convective instabilities, uh, Kuwait, Taylor, all sorts of different kinds of forms of, of sort of weak turbulence, and people tried to estimate this, sometimes getting dozens of dimensions or hundreds of dimensions, not infinite. So again, we're not really interested in the, what's that? Uh, well, yeah, it would be, that's called statistically homogeneous turbulence, where basically Every molecule is doing its own thing. It's as if it was like an ideal gas, right? Something like that, yeah. But below that regime are all these very, very structured flows. In fact, if you go into the hydrodynamics literature, this is very flowery language about wavy uh, double scroll vortices and trying to capture sort of the regularity that the experimentalists are seeing in the flow configurations. Now, using this, you can go in in principle and measure you know, a little more quantitative. How many active degrees of freedom are there um, how much, how unstable is the flow, and so on. So, so it's quite uh, useful, both formally to give some idea of what can happen in terms of classifying behavior. Um, you know, again, we, we're not solving any particular equation to conclude this. The topological structure dynamical systems lets us actually think at this higher qualitative level and get this kind of classification scheme. Okay, so finally, what is a chaotic attractor? I mean, we've been looking at these things. One-dimensional maps, two-dimensional maps, flows, and so on, three-dimensional flows. So just to kind of go through, maybe at this point it's fairly obvious, but I think it's helpful to be precise at some point about this. What up to this point has been a little bit kind of informal use of, intuitive use of the language. Okay, so we want to know what a chaotic attractor is. Well, the first thing is it's an attractor. If you remember, that's some set, subset of the state space. That's an invariant set that the flow takes back into itself. You start in the set, it comes back to itself. In addition to be, to be stable or attracting, there has to be some, some subset of the state space that contains the attractor. So let's think of it. Here's, here's our invariant set. I kind of puff up. There's kind of a neighborhood or vicinity of the invariant set. Call that U. And then under the flow, that set gets sucked back onto the invariant set. And then maybe it's kind of legalese. It also should be this set lambda that we're trying to characterize as an invariant. Attractor, it should be minimal. There's no proper subset of lambda that has both of those properties. In other words, up to this point, if I had two attractors, I would consider the union of them an attractor in that definition. So this is what the minimality is doing. We just want to focus on one of those. There's no way to decompose it into a separate little attractor. OK, but now we're talking about this complicated set of orbits and trajectories, aperiodic long-term behavior. So now we have two ways of, of adding on a criteria to talk about being chaotic. One is that there's at least one Lyapunov exponent on the invariant set that's positive. Or the other is that this metric entropy, komogorov sinai entropy, is positive. So that would be it. So it's a stable invariant set with instability measured by the Lyapunov exponent or the entropy rate. So when someone says chaos, this is what they should mean. Okay, so that sort of finishes up discussion of chaos. Well, now what I want to do for the remainder of the lecture is um, some examples, just to show you that you can calculate some of these things. I mean, I just said, oh, isn't it great? We have this qualitative classification scheme and arbitrary dimensions. Well, sometimes you'd actually like to be able to calculate these things. So what I'm going to do is talk about some one-dimensional maps, discrete time maps, where we can go through and be very explicit about what the Lyapunov exponents are and, and show that there's, there's quite a bit we can't understand. <laughs>